So, good morning, everyone. I'm Giselle Huberman, and I'm the president of the James Wimmick Alliance. And it's a great, great pleasure to welcome you here today. It's too dark. Bring the lights up a little bit. I want to see their faces. A little, and people are walking in. I don't want anybody falling. Bring up the lights a little more. That's good. So, it is my distinct pleasure to welcome you to what is, I believe, the most intellectual, the most learned, the most erudite of our Spring Craft Weekend events. Don't laugh, it's true. I am very happy that you're all here. I am sure you will enjoy it, you will learn, you will appreciate the intellectual curiosity and capacity of this learned panel. You will be amazed. One of the main directives that the JRA has, the James Wemmick Alliance, is to inform our members to foster education and craft and to support educational activities in all of its forms. This panel does it. It does it all and it does it extraordinarily well. So, thank you all for being here and for supporting our efforts. It's great to have you all here. Um, I must thank, I need to thank, and I will thank, the two coaches who have created this amazing and impressive panel, Barbara Wolanin and Nikki O'Neill. I'm not finished with the introduction, Barbara. Don't come up yet. Barbara is the curator of the architect of the Capitol, and she's responsible for the care and preservation of the beautiful artworks in the U.S. Capitol. So if you haven't gone, and if you're traveling to D.C., go see it. It's a marvel. She's also an author, an educator, and an individual who was commended by a senator, and she was written about in the congressional record. How many of us have been? Nikki O'Neill is a glass artist and a passionate naturalist, a PhD in biological sciences. She combines her love of nature with her love for glass art, and she discovers in artwork after artwork the art and science in nature. So here they are, Dr. Wolanin and Dr. O'Neill. Thank you, Gigi. Um, we've actually, to cut time, all the bios and wonderful accomplishments of the panel are on your flyer, so you can follow along with the program. Please do that. Very pleased to have you here, and Gigi told you a little bit about the Renwick Alliance, but if you're not a member, now it's easy to join. You can join on our new website very easily, so hope you will consider that. And uh, thank you to uh, Director Betsy Brune and Robin Kennedy and everybody that's helped with this uh, program and, of course, Gigi and the co-chairs, Brenda Erickson and Bridget Savage, for this Spring Craft Weekend. Um, and this is going to be webcast, so at the end we will have time for questions and discussion, so everybody in the audience needs to be using a mic as well. Okay. Uh, and I'll turn it over to Bruce Metcalf, who was our, one of our Masters of the Medium two years ago, and he is the one that's organized this, picked the panelists, and going to keep everybody on time, right? Okay. All right. Well, welcome. So, decoration has a long and conflicted history. If we go back far enough to, into the earliest human cultures, decoration is taken as a sign of the very birth of culture, one of the things that separate us from animals. And yet, in the modern era, decoration was held to be superfluous and, frankly, stupid. With the advent of postmodernism, the modernist proscription was turned on its head, and decoration is again very much with us. So today we have an all-star panel here to discuss the issue. Garth Clark is without doubt the most distinguished writer on craft subjects in America today. He was the recipient of the 2005 Mather Award for Art Criticism, which is a very high honor indeed. For years, he was the principal of the Garth Clark Galleries and, in, and is presently the editor-in-chief of C-File, the go-to site for all things ceramics. Ulysses Dietz is the curator of decorative arts at the Newark Museum in Newark, New Jersey. He has been a dedicated advocate for fine crafts for many decades and has amassed an excellent collection of contemporary ceramics and jewelry for his institution. If you haven't been to the Newark Museum, go, okay? 
Judith Schechter at the end of the table is the best artist in stained glass in the country today, bar none. And she is also, dare I say, a street walking cheetah with a heart full of natosh. Natosh. <laughs> <laughs> she is. Molly Hatch is a ceramist with a strong interest in decoration. She will publish two new books this fall, or this spring. She has also licensed her designs for industrial production, which puts her in a rather rarefied company today. So I have, we are going to follow a format today. I have asked each panelist to prepare two so short presentations. We'll go through the first round, break for some discussion in the panel, then we'll do the same for the second round of presentations and yet another discussion, and finally, we'll close with questions from the audience. So to begin, we start with Ulysses. <laughs> Surprise. And I, I hope we can bring the lights down on the stage. Yeah, lights down on the stage, please. Because I've got my cell phone out because I have a timer on it. I'm glad to be up here again. Just a few years ago, I was here making a fool of myself on this very stage for Nicholas Bell for the 40 Under 40 Symposium. And I'm thrilled to be back. Uh, for seven minutes. <laughs> <laughs> and so the answer about decoration and the crafts in the 19th century is yes, there was a lot of it, and it was important. Uh, oh, do I have to hold this thing? Forget it. All right. Uh, and I just, the, the title page here, and I'm still waiting for the lights to go down so you can see the images better. But just to show you that it's not just in the 19th century, but the idea of decoration as something important in the world of, of fine craft lasts well into the modernist era, well into the 20th century. This is the Arts and Crafts window designed by Lamb Studios, uh, designed by a woman for Lamb Studios in 1927 for the new Newark Museum building in, in, where I work now. But let's just go through the sort of five basic media. Ceramics. Ceramics, yes. Decoration was all important. The idea of decoration is what took an ordinary household object and made it into a work of art. This is a concept that exists, of course, through centuries and millennia even, but it really is codified in the 19th century and becomes the sort of mainstay of the high end of decorative arts production in all media. So on the left, you have an 1882 vase by the Rookwood Pottery, decorated by Mariah Longworth Nichols, the socialite turned potter, uh, and then turned back to socialite, uh, uh, as, who created the Rookwood Pottery that had a long and successful life. And on the right, one of the products of that pottery later on, uh, Matthew Daly, 1902 for Rookwood, purchased by the Newark Museum in 1914 for $20. And the whole idea of the ceramic vessel was the idea of a pot as canvas, the idea of a, of a blank vessel as a blank canvas that could be transformed into a work of art through decoration. In this case, both of these are under glazed slip, but there were plenty of ways to decorate ceramics uh, under, uh, other than that. The styles and the techniques evolved with the period, and they reflect whatever the predominant theories of decoration are at the moment, which I'll get into later. But of course, monochrome ceramics coming out of China. The Chinese porcelain vessel with the monochrome glaze is there and present and to me evokes the beginning of minimalism and modernism even though we don't usually think of it that way. In terms of metal, same deal. Labor-intensive craftsmanship and complex techniques added to the evident prestige of objects. Craftsmanship implied money to pay for it and it, therefore it added to the prestige of the object and the owner of the object. And everything in the 19th century was about money and beauty and power that that implied. Uh, uh, the objects, the decoration elevated the prestige of the craftsman who mostly was anonymous. In these cases, the craftsmen are known. Eugene de Soligny uh, designed that piece. John T. Curran designed the one on the right. But because of Tiffany and Company who manufactured both of these, the one on the left for the centennial in 1876, the one on the right in 18 karat gold uh, as, a, as a golden anniversary gift in 1895, the actual craftsmen were less important than the brand name, and this is part of that money, beauty, power <clears throat> thing. 
Tiffany, by establishing itself as a brand name, uh, undercut the importance of the craftsmen, except in the evidence of their work. I will say that little gold coffee pot, these are all part of the Newark Museum collection, that's part of a set we have, and that coffee pot was 200 hours of labor by five different people uh, in the course of making it, and that's one little gold coffee pot. So craftsmanship is incredibly important. Decoration, which is the result of craftsmanship, is incredibly important, but it's about status as well as about beauty. Same way in the world of glass. On the left, Tiffany Studios, designed by Elihu Vetter in the 1880s for the Ballantine family of Newark. It's in our Ballantine house. And a piece by Tiffany Studios uh, from 1906 on the right. The painterly qualities of glass, both light and color, were developed and expanded in the 19th century as glass production techniques, as glass technology and chemistry became more uh, well known and more sophisticated, and therefore putting glass sort of at the vanguard of experimental media, as it has been all through the 20th century. But that, uh, that avant-garde approach to things really has its roots in the 19th century and in the decoration of glass in two very different ways uh, uh, as you find in the late 19th and early 20th century. And again, with furniture, all of this is the same thing. On the left, Potier and Stymus, the secretary, made in 1878 for the Mark Hopkins house, one of about 500 pieces of furniture like this produced for that house in 1878 uh, and shipped across the country to San Francisco. And on the left, a much plainer and yet equally decorated chair by Gustav Stickley in Syracuse, New York, produced in 1910 out of curled maple. All of the branches of woodworking, so turning, carving, inlay, and in, uh, in the case of the cabinet, you'll see a close-up later on, uh, and you'll see something in more focus, but uh, you've got two kinds of metal and five kinds of wood being inlaid in each of those panels. Uh, all of this is the same as it was with metalwork. They are technical tour de force that the implication of difficulty and skill and craftsmanship adds to the perceived value and the perceived expense Every single object made in the 19th century, including the ones that were made by artists, were, were analyzed by Americans according to what their imagined or advertised cost was. And I'm just being cynical about that, to pretend we loved art for art's sake. If you look at all the great collections built in the 19th century, they always talk about the cost. And the perception of value comes from craftsmanship and decoration. The decoration is incredibly important because of what it does. And then finally, uh, still out of focus, on the two quite different kinds of things. On the left is a crazy quilt from the 1880s made by a group of women uh, collaboratively in Providence, Rhode Island in 1884, the eldest of whom uh, you can see, actually some of you don't care about this, but some of these blocks were actually made by women from the, who were born in the 18th century and are still working in earlier quilt types. But, the crazy quilt is a brilliant idea because it's a hobby work. It is, it is, it is technically an unskilled craft because these, these are made by women who are supposed to not work and not supposed to be artists and nonetheless get together and make these extraordinary works of art, which is more intuition. You can call them folk art. But it really is about this obsessive application of craft with the stitching and the patching and the appliques and the, and the, and the inking and all of the things that go into a crazy quilt in very modern styles influenced by global aesthetic trends uh, really create something that is very much of that time, although it comes from a slightly different area. And on the right, I, I just had to throw this in here, and it's really impossible to see it on uh, the way it looks there. This is a paisley shawl that's about five feet square, produced in the, in the United Kingdom in the 1840s, and the most extraordinary technical weaving, which you can't quite see, is this is a pattern of chinoiserie. So it's a paisley shawl, which is an Indian concept, uh, but done in a Chinese manner. And these things were like mink coats. These were the most single expensive piece of worn textiles that you could get in the 19th century. And the reason Paisley shawls have such currency is they have incredibly high status, and a lot of that comes from the high level of decoration, which is the result of a highly skilled craft technology. And that's it for this one. Thanks. Do you have the clicker? Oh, sorry. <laughs> I need this. All right. Um, oops. 
As the 20th century began, it was still inconceivable to design something without decorating it. it vir in virtually all genres of design, decoration was applied to surfaces, and nobody ever thought to separate underlying structure from surface decoration. That distinction came only later in the century. The first stirrings of displeasure with decoration came from architects. Louis Sullivan famously wrote in 1892, it would be entirely for our aesthetic good if we should refrain entirely from the use of ornament for a period of years, in order that our thought might concentrate acutely upon the production of buildings well formed and entirely in the nude. This is 1892. Of course, nobody paid Sullivan the least amount of attention at the time, but his critique was taken up in 1908 by an obscure Viennese architect, Adolf Loos. Loos famously equated decoration with criminality, writing, the Papuan tattoos his own skin, his boat, his rudder, his oars, in short, everything he can get his hands on. He is no criminal. The modern man who tattoos himself is a criminal or a degenerate. So if you have a ta tattoo. The modern man of our own times who covers the walls with erotic images from inner compulsion is a criminal or a de degenerate. I have discovered the following truth and present it to the world. Cultural evolution is equivalent to the removal of ornament from articles of everyday use. It's not clear anybody paid attention to Loos at the time, but clearly a debate was opened. Somewhat later, in the mid-1920s, architects and designers were seized with the desire to represent the modern age in a language that was specifically and plainly modern. This desire was motivated by pervasive disgust with European civilization, which had led directly to the disaster of World War I, in which eight million or more men had died. If bourgeois civilization, with its overstuffed chairs and heavy drapery, could cause such destruction, then maybe it was time for something else. And then what should this language be? It would be the language of machines, of repetition, geometry, and unadorned surfaces. So here's what the old architecture looked like. George Gilbert Scott's St. Pancras Station in 1874. And here's the new. Le Corbusier's Houses for an Exhibition in Stuttgart, 1927. This new language of the modern was codified at the Bauhaus, the radical design school in Germany. At first, the Bauhaus embraced a rather wild expressionist style informed by painting. But around 1923, the whole school changed direction to embrace a new ge geometric style. One of the characteristics of the new style was to use new industrial materials like glass and steel, as in the steel uh, bent uh, structure in this chair, which were seen as standing for the contemporary moment. Wood and clay were out. Another part of the issue was that the Bauhaus had to develop income by licensing its designs to industry. So the new style was intended to be mass produced relatively cheaply. In some cases, it was even true. Designs for furniture, as in the B32 chair here, lamps, and textiles were all put into production and made money for the school. <clears throat> In time, an ideology coalesced around this new style. The watchword was, form follows function. The idea was that the new design should answer to the functional requirements of the object, from teapots to buildings, with perfect efficiency. Anything that did not contribute to the usefulness of the design was to be excised. In addition, pure geometry was deployed as a metaphor for the modern age. The new design was to consist of cylinders, cones, cubes, and spheres. Needless to say, decoration was not part of the picture. Several American intellectuals found the new design highly seductive, and they found a willing, willing partner in the director of the brand new Museum of Modern Art, Alfred Barr. A number of radical exhibitions were mounted at MoMA, promoting both modern architecture and product design. The most notorious of these was the machine art in exhibition of 1934, which enshrined springs and gears as almost abstract sculpture. 
German functionalism, as it was called at the time, was not the only design style with a claim to being modern. There was a hugely popular decorative style in the air at the same time, the 1920s, French Art Deco. Art Deco was a marriage of traditional French decorative arts and cubism, which led to some rather strange children. <laughs> However, Art Deco was dedicated to luxury, and it became impossible to maintain after the Depression hit in 1929. In the culture war between decoration and functionalism that took place in the 30s, functionalism emerged the clear victor. It took a while, though. MoMA continued to promote its version of functionalism through a series of exhibits in the 1950s called the Good Design Series. In these, unornamented design was held to be morally good, highly useful, and more efficient than any competing alternative. By 1955, MoMA's version of good design triumphed. Even middle America got on the bandwagon somewhat with its embrace of Scandinavian modern design. So at any rate, craft followed suit from silversmithing and wood turning to glass blowing. <clears throat> Unornamented surfaces became the default position. Both functional and non-functional crafts tended to be simple, structural, and devoid of decoration. In many circles, decoration became a dirty word, something to be avoided. One did not decorate, one designed. Of course, decoration never really went away. It applied, acquired a modern gloss in both textile design and in ceramics. But decoration no longer had a logic a cohesive theory to explain its role in contemporary society. It couldn't be explained as having a moral force as exponents of the Gothic revival claimed. It could no longer have the patriotic and subtly racist allure of, of the neo-colonial. It couldn't even have the jazzy appeal of Art Deco. Decoration temporarily lost its argument that it had a place in history. And then by the late 1950s, young craftspeople like Lenore Tawney, and Peter Volkos introduced a new kind of craft that allied itself with abstract art. The new abstract craft was big and ambitious and non-functional. It did not allow any place for decoration because it was all structure and form. It made no sense to decorate an abstract sculpture. And so decoration receded even further into the background. By 1970, decoration had become something of a recessive cultural gene. It languished in lowbrow culture and in small corners here and there, but it had no power. Decoration had to wait until the 1980s when new arguments for its value began to be advanced for its eventual revival. This is a little bit like speed dating, isn't it? <laughs> um, so excuse me for one moment as I do my cuffs. This shirt was an act of ostentation on my point. <laughs> and with these cuffs, I certainly trump Ulysses's bow tie. <laughs> OK. Uh, the right, uh, left button. The decorative in craft. Um, decorative craft is a branch of decorative art. Ah. Is that better? Um, modern craft is a branch of decorative art, therefore almost everything it does ends up being, by definition, decorative. The one exception is hardcore utilitarian craft meant to labor and not to be pretty. It may be pretty anyway, but that is not the primary intent. Most of the craft that the Renwick collects is loved for its physical glamour, the lust for beauty and extravagant skill. The decorative has never been more vibrantly alive than today, but less so in the crafts. Design is the new nexus for the material and process, and so is uh, fine art and architecture. It has gone viral in those disciplines, while craft, <laughs> I would argue, is lagging behind today. 
Let me introduce, introduce a newish model that began to appear a decade ago and its poster boys, the international toast of the decorative world, the Haas twins. Showing them at a craft forum is like entering a party for minimalists with Jeff Koons on my arm. But in a way, that is the point. They represent the other. The oozy, sloppy, dumpy, lumpy, casual indifference to craft formalism, but, and this is very important, not craft itself, that makes most craft lovers bristle with anger. And if we are very, very quiet, we can't be because I have to talk throughout my whole seven minutes. As I show these visuals, you will hear bristling in this room. <laughs> and also the whoosh sound you hear will be my credibility leaving it. <laughs> My first response to them is that they were pursuers. Their bio and their arduous two-year climb to fame is all in boldface, seemed too privileged and too sudden. Five years ago, Simon was a musician and Nikki a vegan cook. They'd never made anything of their own. They moved to LA at age five. Um, they moved to LA and at age five, their brother Lucas had played the Amish boy in The Witness with Harrison Ford <laughs> and has acted in Hollywood ever since. So Lucas introduced them to Leonardo DiCaprio <laughs> and sharing a glass of champagne in his home, they told him that the pedestals for his art sucked. <laughs> he said, make better ones, they did. Then Toby Maguire saw them and said they were better than the art, and he gave them a helping hand, offering his Sony office for them to design. Then it picked up, and amongst others, the twins gave Lady Gaga her wings. <laughs> After two years, Donatella Versace invited them to make a limited edition sofa in the shape of her lips. The last part is not true. Who needs a sofa that big? Their design sold initially for 42,000 when it was released. Oh, those are the lips. Um, <laughs> their design sold for $42,000 when it released. It now trades for $435,000. There is something orgiastic, orgiastic about their art. Uh, sex is not a metaphor for them, but a very musky and real presence. The case in point is the scrotum chair. Now that is not the chair. It would be very difficult and uncomfortable to, to sit on. Um, that is the chair. The scrotum chaise take, took 4,000 man hours to sew and replicate this very distinctive texture on a cold day. To give it a fig leaf, it has been nicknamed the California Raisin. <laughs> These, the hairy animals are, are seats with bronze genitals. You can't see them, they're hidden in the fur, but you can find them in moments of need. <laughs> they have reptilian feet, and some of them are big enough to be ridden. Some are small. and are almost like pets and certainly are very decorative. <laughs> For ceramics, they invented a method of slip accretion and devised rich gold glazes that are extravagantly complex and light responsive using materials that had never before been used for this purpose. So you understand that their approach to materials is not a trivial one. Now at their 8,000 square foot workshop, they have separate studios for glass, ceramics, furniture, metal, wood, fabric. Nikki and Simon are both material obsessed and they begin each pro project hands-on together with their technicians. So whether you love them or hate them, the Haas twins are the model of the new decorative artist. 
What fascinates is their freedom. Fixtures on Art Basel, they have multiple passports and travel three leaves through visual arts, performance, installation, and fashion may be the next stop. They are as sought after in the fine arts as in the design world. Yet, when forced to wear a label, they call them desi themselves designers who make art. Welcome to the new decorative in craft. So um, I'm going to talk about my work and my use of the decoration in, in my work. And I want to say thank you for having me, first of all. Um, take a minute to do that. Um, and the use of decoration in my work is as much about uh, my personal as it is about my artistic goals and conceptual interests. My personal obsession with ornament and decoration stems from a fascination with how patterns work and my covetousness of decoration and decorative pattern and my covetousness of objects of history. Um, I delight in the pattern language we've shared through time across culture and class and material. I've described my approach to decoration as a bit of a game of telephone and pattern, where I'm adding my spin to the conversation and passing it on, and I see myself working in a continuum as an artist designer. Am I going backwards? There we go. I use our familiarity with historic patterns and pattern traditions from ceramics, textiles, furniture, and wall coverings as an access point for the viewer. The decoration in my work often helps inform the viewer of what they're looking at through riffs and remixes of familiar patterning and ornament. I aim to introduce a new way of looking at something we might otherwise walk by. One of my career-long goals, as short of a career as it's been so far, I'm only 36. <laughs> um, I'm still at the be you know, beginning, approaching mid-career. Uh, one of my career-long goals has been to create objects that are paintings and paintings that are objects. And in many of my, what I call plate paintings, which you're seeing here, I'm using the round form of the plate to highlight how I read the pattern and also help crop and abstract the original pattern. And by shifting the scale and the toile, as you see here, I'm able to focus attention to what I enjoy about a pattern or how I read a pattern language. And here, this, this narrative within the toile that I'm exploring, by breaking up or, or abstracting the original pattern within the plate form, I begin to visually point to smaller moments or narratives within the pattern, giving you a directed way to look at how I read the imagery in the original pattern from history. So in this case, this is a Victorian uh, v &A, Toile that was an 18th century toile in their, in their collection in London. I'm asking you to look at a plate as you would a painting. So in this case, many plates reference a single plate, the Royal Copenhagen double fluted lace pattern, which we all know so well. I use pattern as an entry point to the work, both visually and conceptually. I'm breaking up the pattern, literally deconstructing the Royal Copenhagen pattern using the plates that make up the composition to highlight the sense of fluidity and motion in the original pattern and emphasize the characteristics of the original pattern that I find most compelling. While retaining enough of the original pattern to allow you, the viewer, an access point through your recognition of the original Royal Copenhagen signature pattern. So can we regard a plate as a painting, or many plates in this case? Uh, this is the last piece of my work that I'm going to share with you. Um, this is what I, t I titled Physic Garden. And it's an installation that I was commissioned to make for the lobby at the High Museum of Art in Atlanta, uh, which was installed in, the Mar in March of 2014, so about a year ago. In designing this piece, I reflected the surface of two 18th century Chelsea porcelain plates from the permanent collection at the High Museum of Art, which you see on the left. So they're small, sort of 10-inch dinner plates. Um, to create the installation which you see on the right installed in their lobby, which is 456 10-inch dinner plates that make up a three-story installation of plate as painting. <laughs> um, and so this scale shift increased the tiny little brush strokes that were in those original pla you know, plates on the left made by Chelsea uh, painters in the 18th century in England. And 
that shift in scale made these tiny brush strokes, these massive gestural paintings, and each little plate became such an incredible abstraction of the overall piece. It really sort of shifted how I thought about myself as a painter. I really started to think about myself as a painter with this piece, even though I had been painting all along. Um, and that act of hand painting it and translating the surface imagery to such a large scale has completely shifted how I'm thinking and I'm, I'm looking forward to the opportunity to do more um, and, and sort of thinking about this relationship of abstraction and whole. And here you see the surface decoration of the 18th century reflection um, of the London Physic Garden sort of reinterpreted as a visual garden for the High Museum. And I, I'm encouraging the visitors to both stay and regard and take a moment to look at plates in a new light, but also to refocus attention back onto permanent collections in the museum as a way to sort of pay homage to where I come from, both in material and also to the decor decoration that I've loved and sort of want for myself so much. So that is how I use decoration in my work. Oh, the light, the light's bright. Um, thank you also for having me. I'm very pleased to be here. <clears throat> Bruce asked me to write about my philosophy of ornament, which I'm calling why I became a militant ornamentalist and learned to stop worrying and love the bomb. The very unnecessariness of ornament or beauty seems to demand rationalization. But is not its persistence and its insistence in culture, despite repeated attempts to eradicate it, evidence of something important? Why are we so afraid of being seduced by decoration anyway? <laughs> My fast and dirty explanation of ornament takes Ellen de Sayanake's broad definition of art as making special, and in this context sees ornament and art as near synonyms. To complicate things, I would say beauty is a near third synonym. How else does one demonstrate the specialness of ordinary objects but to invest precious resources in them? Time, money, materials all serve as demonstrations of our willingness to make a sacrifice. And sacrifice is what separates the wheat from the chaff. Without it, art devolves to mere pleasantries. Ornamentation provides visual, quantifiable proof of an investment, or maybe a better word would be attachment, emotionally, financially, and temporally. That's because it is immediately obvious that a highly embellished object is a resource hog. Details take time, and rightly or not, non-ornamented objects tend to be perceived as easier, faster, and cheaper to make. So why do we need to make some objects more special than, say, mere entertainment? Well, to prove that we give a damn, to prove that we care, to demonstrate that we can reach outside ourselves and connect to others. It's all about the love, people. <laughs> These special things are physical manifestations of love. Now, I have owned several Michael Schunke goblets and a few spectacular Deborah Ceresco goblets and some other amazing glassware because that's what happens when you're a glass artist. Um, I'm, I happen to be an uh, incredible klutz, so basically I usually use plastic cups. But I will tell you that I have learned from interacting with these beautiful goblets to be very careful in how I handle it because they're precious. And I really want to make certain that I don't damage them. Could there be something to the idea that this self-consciousness is the point? That's how I treat cra that how I treat craft objects could be an analog for how I treat other things, like maybe people. And that's just when the object is being used. Now I'm going to talk to you about how, what it means to me as a uh, craftsperson. I am struck by what it means to embellish. I am far away from thoughts of luxury and status. To embellish for me is evidence of love and caring, but it is also an enactment thereof. You get the point. The time spent embellishing is fertile, and the results are that embedded in the appearance of the piece 
is the love and caring necessary to bring it to fruition. When I was a painter, I was encouraged by my abstract expressionist teachers to be direct and pure. When they said the word decoration, and they said it a lot, it was always preceded by the word mirror. And that was a cue to feel soul-shaking shame and doubt. Art was not frivolous. Decoration was that which matched the sofa, and it had no claim to spiritual or intellectual authority. When I first encountered glass, it was as an elective. And everybody knows that electives in art school are sort of analogous to hobbies. They don't matter, in other words. So I felt free to be naughty and indulge my passion for minutia, obsessive detail and doodling and other artistic activities that tend to elaborate the surface but are seen as extraneous to the main subject. Things that my painting teacher would have excoriated me for. I was astounded to find that all the time spent covering the surface with patterns was not actually an irrelevant time suck. What happened during those hours of getting more and more into it was emotional transference. I grew to love the pieces. I love details. I obsessively fill my pieces with as much detail as possible. Is this horror vacui? I don't know. I have undiagnosed ADD. And details are a blow against that particular tyranny. For the viewer as well, ornament makes things interesting, and it's more stuff to look at, so they spend longer looking at it. I know that's simple, but that doesn't make it stupid. <laughs> I find myself out of sync with, well, life if I work minimally. I don't have that many ideas. I want them to last as long as possible. I want to enter into every square inch in the manner of the travelers in the movie Fantastic Voyage who are shrunk down to fit into a syringe and shot into the insides of a person. I want to explore the nanostructures of my pieces. To my mind, every square inch is a vast landscape. Presumably, people looking at my work prioritize the figure since that's what humans do. But I am deeply involved with those backgrounds, which often take a lot longer than the figure. They have to be very absorbing, because I'm going to be spending a lot of time with them, and my fingers are going to bleed and ache on their behalf. So they better matter. But it's more than that. My work would not take so long to make if it were more minimal, and it would cost less in terms of labor. But then I wouldn't love it anymore, and I don't see why you should love it if I don't love it. Could we have the lights up on the stage, please? Thank you. All right, um, some discussion in, among the panel. Uh, so I'm going to start off with the obvious question. Um, how would you define decoration? Anyone? Ulysses. <laughs> I didn't tell them the questions in advance. <laughs> I'm going to talk about that in part two of my talk. But we're talking about it now, so you can you can reiterate, <laughs> you can reiterate what it, whatever wisdom I come up with in the next five seconds. Uh, the application of how would you define decoration? Yeah, the application of color or texture, pattern to the surface of something. Surf All, to surface. Well, that sounds like a trick question, but <laughs> for now, let's go with that. Garth. Um, it, it's really very difficult because Ulysses' um, definition doesn't define it. And I'm not saying that critically, I'm saying that because it's a, it's a very difficult thing to bring down because you can apply color to something but it's not decorative. Oh, well, that's true. You can just paint a wall. You can just paint a wall. You can paint something all white. You've applied color to a black object but it is not decorative. Um, so it brings us back to things like repetition pattern, um, and bear in mind that almost all de decoration began as signs. So now we do a fleur-de-lis and it's something pretty. We even, most people don't even know what the fleur-de-lis comes from. It's just they recognize it as a, as a decorative device. But 
Um, decoration began as signs and signals. Um, Michael Cardew, who is an English potter, um, did a wonderful piece on decoration in native pottery in Nigeria and proved that none of it was decoration. Every single thing they did had a purpose, like the one pot was a beer pot and it had dimples on it, sort of three-dimensional dimples, beautifully organized, just looked lovely. The reason they did that was the beer pots would cool, the water would condense on the outside and they would slip out of your hands. So to stop that, they put these dimples. Now we would look at it and say, oh look, decorative art. No, it was functional art. Um, they did that with something else, they had brushes and they got locust bean liquor um, and slashed it all over the surface and you know, we would look at it and say, ah, early abstract expressionism. <laughs> and it wasn't that, it, it was very beautifully done and they developed a sort of rhythm for doing it. It was there to seal the outside because it was a water jar and they were trying to slow down the rate of evaporation. So I think it's something that we forget is now we just apply this as patterns, you know, it's a chevron because we want that. When it began, it told you something very specific. Molly? I can answer in sort of a continuation or sort of how, in a, in a call and response essentially in my own work, I use our familiarity with some of those patterns and what their relationship to the original function of the object is to help define how I want you to relate or expect certain things from what I'm making. So I think I use decoration and I think the history of decoration is used to imply what how we're supposed to function or give you a sense of, you know, where the handle is or what, you know, is this a decorative thing that we only look at or is it a, an object that was made for someone that is special or is it a, you know, something that's used for every day? I think we, it, it sort of starts to imply how we're supposed to relate to it or we understand the language of decoration because of our, this history that comes with it. When we look at an object today, we sort of that tells us how to relate to it, whether it's something that's precious or something that we're supposed to use every day or something that has been thought about or um, something that's just a color. You know, and I think that that can help imply, it's a tool that I use in, th in that sense um, and take advantage of that his kind of history to make it something that we maybe see in a different way. So for example, even in my design work when I'm manufacturing, there's a long history of using teacups and saucers, and I don't use teacups and saucers in my day-to-day. -day. I'm a mug user, but I love the aesthetic of the, you know, historic teacup and saucer. And so I took, I said, well, well how can I make that teacup and saucer exist in a designed object that makes sense for my day-to-day -day life? So I did a drawing of a teacup and saucer and put it on a mug. <laughs> I'll, I'll give Judith a pass on this question. Here, no, I want to add. I want to. Okay, I want right. to say something. Right. It, it strikes me just in listening to what you guys say that culture, in since like we crawled out of the Rift Valley, has experienced a a big bang expansion. That we're even we're talking about it in such modernist terms, like like as a response as the stuff that goes on a structure. So. It seems to me that there was a time when not only was craft and art the same thing, but so was decoration, so was uh, uh, science and religion and art were much more closely connected. So the fact that we recognize them as different seems significant to me. I don't know what it means, but it, uh, it seems strange. No wonder we struggle to define it. I mean, when you first said, what's the definition, my first thought was, well, patterns. And I, I, I kind of disagree with the idea of a plain painted wall is not decorative. I think it is. A, a plain wall that's unpainted is, is not decorated. But it's just very minimal, that's all. Minimal decoration, that can exist. <laughs> all right. Here's a question. It's not mine, it's from Gigi. So the question is, and I think it's a good one, why does decoration matter? Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go all artist on this and say that the reason I'm so, I mean, I, I come at the contemporary craft world entirely out of the 19th century, which was my specialty in which I've spent many of my 35 years in Newark studying the Gilded Age. And to me it matters because I get a visceral emotional response out of decorative surfaces. 
wall coverings, upholstery, textiles, carpets, ceramics, glass, silver, furniture. All of those things make me respond emotionally and viscerally, and that's why it matters. A minimalist interior, a minimalist space, it's taken me all of my adult life to learn to get any kind of a response out of that. And, and it doesn't, and, it, and because it just took a long time. It took me a long time to get into the arts and crafts movement because it's so plain, it's all brown and green. And, uh, <laughs> but the rest of it is easy. It's almost like a primary reaction to me as a child. My first big museum exhibition is the 19th century America at the Met when I'm 15 years old. And I still have that catalog and it changed my life. So that's why it matters to me is because that's how my mind responds to things. Um, it's, a, it's a tough question, um, you know, does decoration matter compared to global warming? Um, <laughs> but um, it's sort of, it's not even that it matters, it's that it's inevitable. There's something in the human organism that requires decoration. Um, it's also important from another point of view if we're looking at cultures because we can determine the affluence of an early culture based upon the amount of ornament. Because ornament takes time. And in a community where it's hard scrabble, there is not the time to produce ornament. So when you get to see, even like you know, I live in, in Santa Fe, you get to see ornament appearing in, in, in Indian pottery uh, when they become more organized, when their farms are producing more and their communities are being, beginning to be large enough for a few people in that village to become uh, specialists in decoration. Um, but it does, as you point out, it does take time. And so, so you can see the evolution of the affluence of a culture very often by the quantity and quality of its decoration. Molly? And then there's the French Revolution and everything implodes. <laughs> um, Julia Galloway is a potter who talks about how the pinnacle of, of ornament and decoration meets its most you know, insane amount of time spent and decorative. And then you know, the Chinese, <laughs> like there's a massive collapse, or there's the French Revolution. or so. And she keeps wondering where we're headed. Um, in our in our obsession, current obsession with de ornament and decoration, and I'm with her. Um, but I think there's an interesting, you know, I think my passion um, for ornament is sort of grounded in um, the it as a language, I guess, and it feels like a way to connect throughout time and throughout culture and vis through a visual language. And I think that there's different permutations, I and mean, we can talk about all those different permutations, but I, you know, I speak about it as sort of me adding to my two cents to this continuum of sort of telephone with pattern where um, there's this sort of long stream of everyone reinterpreting everyone over centuries, and I think there's something really poetic and lovely about that. But it, at the very sort of basic level, I remember sitting in my being sick and sitting on my parents' sofa and looking at the trees outside the window and in that sort of meditative state of fever, I'm watching the patterns that would create or watching clouds that create. We, we just, like Garth says, we sort of naturally gravitate to recognize things within things. And so I think my interest and obsession with pattern is sort of figuring it out. So by spending time with it, I see different things in it. And so the more complex the pattern, the more there is to look at and more there's time there is to spend with it and sort of meditate. And your mind goes to interesting places with it. And I think that's where that sort of covetousness of pattern and history and the, and the opulence of decoration comes in for me. And so it's important both in you know, creating a meditative, meditative space as a maker and as a viewer, but also in this connectivity between, you know, as a language, from a Chinese artisan to 200 years ago or 300 or 400 years ago to myself adding to that conversation today. Whether I have the right to add to that conversation today is another question, but um, I think that that's all, you know, sort of part, I mean, it's a bit not very articulate way of talking about it, but I think that's, that's my love of, and, and interest in it existing. Bruce, can you repeat the question? Um, why does decoration matter? 
Why does it matter? Oh, I, I thought I answered it by saying that it shows that we care. But I will add to that that I think um, short of living a 24-7 subsistence level uh, life, people will decorate. It's not just that rich people like it and buy it. I mean, people will do things to their environment to embellish it because that's what people do. And I think that we don't want to think of our lives as just like, you know, we eat, we procreate, we sleep, and then we die. You know, it attaches us to some greater meaning. And like I said in the essay, the greater meaning has to be love. So it's a way of sort of saying, I don't have very much time, but with the little time that I do, I'm going to make this tapestry. <laughs> I look at those tapestries from, from like the uh, medieval and renaissance, and I think, those people, didn't they die when they were 30? That's a really amazing way to spend your life. Uh, <laughs> that's all I have to say. <laughs> okay, we will now go to the second round of presentations. Could you bring down the stage lights? And Ulysses is on again. Oh, God. <laughs> Well, I don't know about you, but I'm enjoying this amazingly. <laughs> so, some theories of dec yeah, decoration. <laughs> no, I, that wasn't a visceral response. That's just not my slide. <laughs> I love Judith's work, and I love Molly's work for that matter. OK, uh, and uh, I'm going to repeat something Bruce said in his talk. But So we'll talk about a few dead white men, because apparently that's all we can do in the civilization. We have John Ruskin from left to right, John Ruskin, Owen Jones, Adolf Loos, and Frank Lloyd Wright. Because when Bruce asked me to talk about theories of decoration, I wasn't quite sure what he meant. And then I thought, well, what do I think about when I look at an object and try to figure out where to put it in the spectrum of my experience as a curator? So we have Ruskin and his naturalism, in his, uh, as espoused in his great book, The Stones of Venice. Uh, here you have on the upper left a sketch that he did in 1848 of a bit of carving underneath a, trans a transept vault rib at uh, Gisors uh, in France. And he was all about uh, the, the power, the moral power of decoration to bring nature into the human world, both for architecture and for objects. And as I quote from, interestingly enough, an American decorating magazine of 1889, the Decorator and Furnisher, which was the commercial organ of the decorating trade in the 19th century, Ruskin is quoted as saying, nobody ever used conventional art to decorate with when he could do anything better. And I'll explain conventional art in a second. And to know that by using, by doing better, he, that it would be safe. A great painter will always give you natural art, safe or not. So it was the naturalism that had the moral force. And here, the other two objects in this slide, on the lower left is the crest of a sideboard in our collection made in the 1850s in New York by Alexander Rue, using most likely imported French carvers. But this embrace of the naturalistic theme, which was not only in painting, but in all aspects of the decorative arts, textiles, silver, ceramics, uh, furniture. Uh, and totally explosive in the mid-19th century. And on the right, a painting of a spray of fuchsia uh, by William Sidney Mount, for, done in 1859, embodying this Ruskinian notion that perfection in art was all about the representation of nature honestly and accurately. Now, that was superseded uh, quite radically uh, by Owen Jones, who wrote his great grammar of ornament and of course, I forgot to put the date down, but in the 19th century, hundreds of color plates showing ornamental ideas from around the world. And the premise that Jones, who was an architect and a designer and an early developer of color theory, his notion was to reject naturalism and to say that everything natural should be used to ornament the surfaces of functional objects and to make them better, but you needed to abstract and conventionalize and compress to stylize nature. And that was the only accurate, the only proper way to decorate objects. 
And on the lower left, you see a a drawers from that same cabinet, uh, which was made in New York, but purely uh, and in a very early manifestation demonstrates that South Kensington school that, uh, of, of aesthetics, of, of, na of stylization and conventionalization that Owen Jones espoused. And above it, a later manifestation that a piece of grooby pottery, uh, entirely handmade, uh, but using conventionalized, stylized, almost abstracted organic designs uh, at the very end of the 19th century, 1897. And I'll point out that the Newark Museum bought that in 1910 for $20, uh, which was a lot of money for it then. And then back to Adolf Loos. And uh, although Bruce questioned whether anyone listened to him, I think a lot of people listened to him. At least every art history student who ever takes a general art history course in college hears about Adolf Loos. And here you have the poster for his original great public statement of ornament and crime. And I'll, I'll recite what, what Bruce said, is that he believed he was, he was an Austrian, but he was born in Czechoslovakia. But he, his, really, his premise was that progress of culture was linked inextricably with the deletion of ornament from everyday objects. It was a crime to force craftsmen or building tradesmen to waste their time on ornamentation. Sorry, Judith. Uh, <coughs> uh, he did not reject rich surfaces, rich materials like wood and marble and metal. He only rejected the use of decorative treatments. And here you have the Villa Steiner, which 1910, that is a freaky radical building in 1910. Who would believe it's that? Think about that. That's about the time that, I don't know, I think of all the great mansions being built in the US in that same period. So he was pretty much ahead of his time. And I also love the fact that the Villa Muller, which is from the 1920s, he must have gone freaking insane at what the Mullers put into their house. Because <laughs> that's really ditzy furniture. So I love the, I must have, it must have, he must have made, uh, uh, his clients must have made him crazy. And of course, the answer to that is to be all controlling like Frank Lloyd Wright, who really isn't a separate thing, because, but he's, he is in America the voice of emerging modernism along with the whole uh, the Prairie School. And, and upper left is his dining room in Oak Park, Illinois. And I, I think of him as a modernist in the sense that he was also, he was sort of a moderate. He wasn't as crazy as Adolf Loos, whose, whose feelings would certainly take sway and, and take more force later on. But he believed in ornamentation, but he was sort of an extremist on the Owen Jones scale of abstraction and minimalism, so that ornament becomes totally subservient to the form, whether it's an object or a piece of architecture. And he wasn't alone in that. On the lower left is a fabulous house, now gone, that was built uh, in South Orange, New Jersey, by George Washington Mayer uh, for a man named Leach. And on the right, the third part of the triumvirate of the Prairie School, Purcell and Elmsley, one of a series of clear story windows from a bank in Madison, Minnesota, made in Minneapolis, uh, that I, one of which I acquired for the museum. And here you see, certainly you see ornaments, you see color, you see all the beauties of glass, but uh, controlled by the designer and abstracted down to the point where it becomes uh, uh, controlled and rather than just visceral, it's, it's intellectualized and abstracted to the point where I guess it's acceptable. And, and so between Loos and the Frank Lloyd Wright and the Prairie School idea, you get the two strains of modernism, one of which uh, the Adolf Loos School will ultimately defeat uh, at the highest level, in the academic level, in the high art world, but in the popular level, in ordinary human being lives, uh, the decorative never goes away and never is defeated. It's just ignored by museums for 75 years. <laughs> And so, and just the final thing, what all these theories, these sort of theories that they have in common, is that according to those men who spoke for them and advocated them, they are the only correct choice. They have all of the cultural fluidity of religious fundamentalism. Uh, <laughs> I have, as, through my whole career as a curator, I've done nothing but reject dogmatism in decorative theory uh, because that kind of narrow-mindedness is no place for a curator. Thank you. All right. Oops. What happened? Whoops. Okay. I guess it's gone.
Yeah, I know. It's supposed to be, by the way. It's just he wasn't supposed to start it. Um, okay. Amy Golden, 1976. Uh, decoration can be intellectually empty, but it does not have to be stupid. So that slide was to get stupid out of the way quickly so that we could begin to work on things that are more serious. Um, this is really just a very quick romp, and it has to be very quick because there are about 70 slides which scared everybody involved with this presentation, imagining b me being here for three and a half hours. Um, things are changing in design quite a lot. Uh, let me go back to Hella Jongeres. Um, one of the leading international designers known for her, her tough material, textured, craft look, Everything is beginning to change now. Things that we would call decadent are certainly beginning to replace modernism. And virtually nothing comes out anymore that doesn't have decoration on it. The pure white has gone. This is Jamie Hayon. Jamie Hayon is probably the most successful uh, designer in the world today. Um, everything he does is extraordinarily decorative which is good because it sometimes covers up the poor forms that lie underneath them. Um, and decoration doesn't necessarily have to be totally pretty. You've got Melody D. Rose uh, working with decoration, which you could call adult in a way. And then Marek Sisula. I mean, we, we know Marek. Marek used to work here. He was and it is an extraordinary force. Pure white modernist, now all of a sudden, like all the other designers, beginning to move into a much more radical format. The same thing is happening with uh, architecture, perhaps most revolutionary of all, because architects have a deep, deep abiding fear of color. Um, and with that comes an even deeper, darker fear of pattern, but that is all changing. You know, look at that design school. And, you know, I sit at my desk at C-File. These things come through to me all the time. And this is happening throughout architecture now. It's just being seized by decoration. This is the Bronthurst Museum in Munich. Um, a ceramic building. Just exquisite. From a distance, it just looks like a blur of colors. When you get to it, it's all these beautiful bars of ceramic. Um, the Children's Education Center in Spain. Uh, the Spanish are really way ahead of everybody in, in the use of tile and particularly color. And even Daniel Liebeskind, um, in one of the few good buildings he's ever designed. <laughs> Have any of you ever been to Denver and experienced that horror? Um, Working with, with uh, especially designed um, um, clay tiles and impressing them with, with pattern. And Jackie Poncelet, some of you, in fact, people sitting right there have Jackie Poncelet pots in their collection, but now working on decoration on, an, on a huge scale. This is a building adjacent to a, a train station in London. Grayson Perry. Those people, too, have Grayson Perry in their collection. Um, that is his building. That is his seaside house that was done for him by fat architects. They are the most wonderful architects. They sort of started up as a kind of protest movement, worked for a year, got very successful, continued working, and then decided, no, they were going to all close down at the height of their success because the whole idea was to be against the system. And the thing is, it's the perfect home for him because Grayson can be a little decorative himself. <laughs> now, the point of this is you are looking all at the top end of the art world now. Most of these images um, come from, um, boy, this really is a lively presentation. Um, <laughs> You know, the, old, the king of decoration, Damien Hirst, at $500 a dot. <laughs> um, 
But then other ways as well. Ken Hildy Wiley has a show up at the Whitney at the moment. Um, Brooklyn, sorry. Nick Cave, this is a um, wallpaper that he did. And um, Yenka Shonabare. I mean, let's face it, you know, cake de decoration is the ultimate form of decorative art. But the point of all of this now, Amadiyap, is that this is what you see when you go to Art Basel. The decorative now is completely uh, moved in. That difference that once existed between uh, the decorative and the um, fine arts has disappeared. When I went to the Royal College of Art, my professor uh, of art history, an extraordinarily vindictive man um, <laughs> with gray hair and twinkly blue eyes, looked like everybody's sort of favorite dad was actually a, an assassin and killed many of his students, um, said to me, he said, well, what do you like? I said, I like minimalism and I like high decoration. And he said, that's ludicrous. And I said, why? He said, because the one is the enemy of the other. And I didn't believe it at the time. I still don't. And it's still what I take. The craft materials are everywhere. Paula, Paula Hayes at Salon 94 in New York installations that deal with the issue. And this is just a very small sampling. One of my favorite artists, Joanna Vasconcelos, works with fabric, sometimes giant scale, entire buildings. Um, these are ceramic animals that she then covers with uh, lace. And one of my favorite of all, Mr. Gupta, Indian sculptor. Um, this is a, an extraordinary piece. You're seeing a detail of it now. Does these beautiful, beautiful giant uh, vehicles with these little, little dots, like a kind of three-dimensional pointillism. Ai Weiwei doing scaffolding with Ming decoration. And then it's in photography as well. Again, I could choose 20 artists to do this. This is Candida Hofer. Uh, my 70th birthday is coming up in two years. Anybody wants to buy me one of these, I'd be most grateful. And a wonderful 23-year-old artist by the name of Mohammed Ganji who has gone in and rephotographed the mosques in really the most extraordinary manner. And it gets more spectacular than this once we move into light art. Miguel Chevalier um, takes over giant spaces. I don't know where this cathedral is, but it is a cathedral. And um, not only does he take over these spaces and produce these beautiful um, um, patterns, go back. Um, but if you walk through them, the patterns change. The movement of your body through it begins to reorganize the patterns into new configurations. So what that does now is it leaves us with a question. Now that the decorative belongs to everyone, what can craft offer? Can craft compete or find its own place in the face of this kind of competition? Thank you very much. Maybe I'm on now. Whoops. Do you want me to go? Or do you want to find your seat? These are out of order. Oh, why don't you go? I'll, yeah. Maybe we should you out. Yeah, you're just talking. Maybe just repeat that's quite, quite an act to follow. Um, and so we were asked to think about, I was asked to think about the present and future of decoration and craft. And so following Garth, <laughs> um, answering his question, basically. Um, 
And so I wanted to share with you a few artists that I'm looking at and, and who I have the privilege of showing alongside with at many of the art fairs that we just we were just talking about with Garth. And there are several artists that immediately come to mind, um, mostly because I'm looking at them and they're referencing my, um, I'm seeing my work as having a conversation with theirs. So I, I thought that would be the simplest and most straightforward way to approach. Um, and, and their work represents both the present and the future as I see it, because um, I can only claim this from my perspective, <laughs> um, for, for multiple reasons. And the artists I will share with you employ the decorative and many reference the decorative, um, the history of decorative art in their work, and both in subject matter and in their material choices. Um, and this interest and acknowledgement of, their, of material history informing contemporary artists' work is happening now in a big way, myself included. And I believe it's something that will continue in the future. Um, how long, I don't know, but you know, I think it's not going anywhere. So the first artist's work that I want to share with you is US artist, glass, uh, glass artist, Beth Lippman. And Beth uses the decorative and the history of the decorative in her work in a way that de deconstructs and examines our relationship with objects, taking advantage of our familiarity with the still life tradition um, and with traditional glass. And her use of glass is so familiar, like we understand what those things are in that piece we can, in, on a, each individual component level. But at the same time, we've never seen them put together like that. So it, it changes our understanding of what they are. Uh, UK artist David Clark uh, uses pewter and found silver objects in a way similar to Beth. Um, sort of re-examining re re a historic or an object we're familiar with. So he takes advantage of this familiarity that we have with traditional silver and through a sort of mashup of, of then and now, he achieves an entirely new object. And this ex exploration of object form and surface gives a sort of revisionist history as though a tinkerer's repair uh, went bad and resulted in a new object with a new purpose and a completely altered identity. We have this tradition of, you know, fixing broken things of t tinkers of the past, adding, you know, pewter handles and things, and it's sort of, I just, if the, I want David Clark to meet a past tinkerer and see what they did to do, what he, do with each other. Um, so this imaginative playfulness um, involved in manifesting something new out of something old takes confidence, it takes daring, especially in the case of David's work, he's cutting up a previous craftsperson's object and reinventing it in this sort of ultimate example of working in a continuum, right? Like he's literally collaborating with history. Uh, U.S. ceramic artist Beth Cattleman, her wall installations evoke both the opulence and pleasure of the 18th century decorative arts through her use of assembled cast porcelain pieces. In Beth's work, the wall becomes a theatrical stage. She uses the luxuriousness of porcelain and the viewer's expectations of traditional decorative wall panels to seduce us in closer, to have you come take a second look. And upon this closer inspection of Beth's work, there is a reveal of the series of miniature narratives that employ sort of kitsch toy forms and Rococo detailing to create a sort of surrealist revision of this historic tradition and resulting, again, in a, an entirely new understanding of something that we thought we understood. U.S. artist Jennifer Trask, jeweler. She thinks of herself as a jeweler, although I would you know, argue with her about that <laughs> um, for, for many reasons. Uh, she both deconstructs and reconstructs historic gilded frames with her carved bone petals and leaf-spiked antlers intuitively and methodically. Referencing the history of ornament, Jennifer's work explores her fascination with the biolo biological and all of its mysteries, and uniting the bone and the botany in the tradition of Vanita, the 17th century Dutch still life paintings, alluding to the tran transience of life and the presence of death in organic matter. It's some of her, some, some to quote her directly in that use of language. She uses beauty as a lure. She's luring us in with the beauty of the object, and as do many of the other artists that I show you, and then when you find out that she's got bone and teeth and um, you know these intense materials combined with this gorgeous ornate frame from the history, you just completely rethink what you're looking at. So again, like the others, she's luring you in with this ornament and this beauty. 
U.S. artist Sherry Mendelssohn makes handmade sculptures that are constructed out of discarded plastic bottles and inspired by ancient vessels. So her interest lies in the balance between emulating ancient objects that she loves so much and creating her own original vessels that reflect those. And at first glance, again, her work looks like something we think we know. We think it's glass and we think we know what it is. And I've seen people knock her pieces over in art fairs and go, <gasps> and then they bounce off the floor. And <laughs> it's kind of amazing. Um, and upon closer look, a logo or a, a recycling stamp or some sort of impression in the plastic is a reveal of, of what we're actually looking at, which are these found objects that have been reconstructed to make works that reference objects of the past. Um, and this transformation of form, you know, reflects both our, you know, current issues with how we relate to the making of things and our use of, and consumption of things, but also her love of decoration and history. Uh, I, this is a second piece by David Clark that I wanted to share with you. Um, and it seems to point further to abstraction of the expected than his, the previous piece I showed you. And his work is a real appraisal, reappraisal, excuse me, of traditional techniques and material, encur encouraging us to reassess the historical view of silversmithing, the traditional roles of objects in our day-to-day -day lives and, and beyond. And these objects, while embodying change of identity towards the unrecognizable, seem, are, are, are still, you know, representations of the past. So, um, and what we expect out of an object. So he's done this wonderful job of having an object sort of simultane simultaneously represent past, present, and in my opinion, future. And finally, I want to share the, ja the work of Japanese artists, uh, Katsuyo Aoki, which I'm sure I'm mispronouncing, and I apologize, Katsuyo. As an example of where I see decoration and craft heading in the future, a sort of further abstraction and reinvention of form and material in object. With a strong grounding in history and material tradition, Katsuyo makes complex, abstract, and decorative ceramic forms, alluding to narratives based on both historical narratives, ideas, and myths, and some also um, sort of spiritual narratives included. And these repurposing and retheorizing uh, in, in her work of past um, aesthetic traditions and examining sort of our contemporary relationship with those um, through sort of fantasy and object and material and decoration is amazing. I, I, I'm so fascinated by her work. And I think what she's doing is asking us to consider these in a, a completely new way and taking what a lot of these other artists that I've shown you who are not uh, and myself include not totally pushing towards the abstraction of that decoration in a, in a smart, quite, quite yet. But I think she's doing it in a way that I think we're going to see more of. And, and have, it'll require us to understand what we're looking at a little bit deeper with more information behind it. So that is my understanding of the present and future of decoration and craft. Judith, I think you're next. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see if it's me or Bruce. It's, it's a, a fun game. Lot of presentation. Oh, it's me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, this is seven minutes of, uh, of stream of consciousness. And it, I don't know if I really answered the question to, about the present and future of decoration and crafts. Um, but I, uh, this is what I thought <laughs> when asked the question. Science has not spent nearly enough time figuring out doodling. Bastards! Doodles are proto-ornament, and encoded in doodling are the origins of ornament. Most people who get past scribbling doodle a bit, and it turns out doodles and ornament conform to certain paradigms. They're not random. There are grids, dots, calligraphic loops, stars, and spirals. Not a lot more until you get to people who doodle actual images or pictures of things. Now it turns out that these grids and stars aren't random choices, but are what we see when we squeeze our eyes shut or take psychotropic drugs. Now why would that be? What does it mean? There's not enough science on that. There's been a little, but studying uh, 
there's been a little bit of studying a related phenomenon having to do with cave art. And in Wikipedia, um, uh, David Lewis Williams and T.A. Dowson published an article about phosphines, another entopic phenomenon. And they argued, among other things, that non-figurative art of the upper, upper Paleolithic depicts actual visions of phosphines and neurological form constants, probably enhanced by hallucinogens. Um, so, are not doodles, and thereby, by extrapolation, ornamentation, pictures of some sort of biological structure? Then, uh, that when we subconsciously make marks, we're imitating our own neurology. That would be so cool. But I'm not sure what, if anything, it means. Except that if doodling, as I am claiming, is the origin of ornament, it must mean something. And one thing it means is that it won't go away until we mutate into something else. <laughs> All right, see, it's the future. All art seems to follow as a, a structure that is both micro and macroscopic, following roughly the cycle of nature from youth to maturity to decay. Or perhaps it might be better expressed in art terms as naivete, mastery, and decadence. You can see this in individual artists, but also at the macro level in cultural movements. Youth, which doodles might be seen as part of, has fewer established parameters, so it's simpler, less sophisticated. By the mature phase, the work has gained momentum, expectations, and rules. By the last phase, it is characterized by a facility within the structure to the point of exaggeration or decadence. In terms of ornament, this is the cycle that goes from dots and dashes and stars into wild, obsessive, imaginative, overly foliate insanity, the kudzu of art. Inasmuch as one can have the perspective to speculate where we are right now, there is some evidence that we are in or entering a decadent phase. The pendulum swings. We had enough of Adolf Luz. You know, I just think the nerve of that guy. <laughs> his like, ornament's dead forever, because I just really think so. Uh, I, and I, I'm, I'm not, this isn't in my text, but I think the, all the youth culture of tattoos would just really eat him up. Because yeah, it was like, <laughs> Everyone got one, dude. Everyone. <laughs> we had enough modernist brutalism and purity, so now we're looking for frosting, frothing, and gugas again. There seems to be a revival of interest in Baroque style, the most fervid and florid of decorative movements. Now, I don't want to cast aspersions on decoration at all, especially because I'm a militant ornamentalist. But as I wrote this, it occurred to me that ornamentation might become more popular when our culture gets more locked down and rigid and superstitious. I don't know why that would be. Maybe there is some correlation between ornament and a trend towards fundamentalism. If, ornamental, if ornamentation is a form of devotion, as I said in the first part of this chat, then I am referring to the notion that in superstitious times, we are more inclined to make art that pleases a god. History seems to tell us that God likes ornament, and he kind of likes it a lot. <laughs> At least he usually does. <laughs> High modernism, with all its purity and essence, came right around the time Nietzsche declared God dead. That's actually a real chicken and egg question right there. Not a coincidence, and it's not a coincidence that those two events happened at the same time. So in superstitious times, when God is more likely to be fussy, we struggle to appease him or her with ornament. The dual side of ornament is that it can be a gift or can be an attempt at blackmailing or sucking up to the prevailing powers. Related to this is that on a personal level, I think about hoarders. Those who do suffer from horror vacui, but are sadly not artists, so they have no healthy outlet for it other than quote unquote collecting. They appear to be hoarding for psychic padding. Perhaps ornament is a psychic padding for coming weird times. Perhaps we feel better when all spaces are occupied and all gaps are closed, all cavities are plugged and all holes filled. I am guessing this satisfies a deep need not to be empty, 
hungry, alone, and vacant. Ornament can be like keeping your TV on when you're not in the room. It can be comforting noise. Not the best advertisement for it, but at least it hearkens to a great power that it has, and I would not underrate it for that reason. So yes, I do think that decoration is making a comeback, or it has already come back, or it never went away, or whatever, <laughs> in the crafts, in the arts, and anywhere else it might exist. But that's not such a surprise if this turns out to have a biological basis. Um, I have a couple more slides. I don't really feel the need to talk about them that much, because uh, I, I guess I will just keep going. It's only another paragraph. I am personally still reeling from the Industrial Revolution, because now that we can produce ornament that is consistent, it has grown considerably less interesting. No one can sneak in an imp. There is no opportunity to add hidden variations or secret modifications. <clears throat> I guess that any chat about the future should talk about computers. <laughs> Computers should enable ornament in such a way that my fantastic voyage fantasy is horribly, irresistibly enabled. There is nothing like tweaking pixels. <laughs> Photoshop, in my case, turned out not to be a time saver. It only allowed me to obsess over atomic scale detail, and I do. <laughs> As for the great bugaboo of our time, the internet, I am not sure how that will impact ornament. Unto itself, the internet does seem to be the most ornate creation ever, um, but it doesn't match my sofa, so I guess that it can claim to have spiritual authority for what it's worth. I will say that the internet, especially Tumblr, seems to prove to me that young depressed teenagers are trending towards the ornamental, as if that's new. Thank you. Could you have a stage lights up, please? I don't think it's going to come up. All right, some more questions. Um, I would like to ask of, um, of each of you, um, in terms of, of your own careers, uh, do you feel that a resist, did you feel a resistance to decoration when you first started your practice? Start again with Ulysses. Yeah. Uh, the resistance, yeah, well, maybe. Uh, to me, the resistance to decoration sort of goes back to the Adolf Lowe's notion, uh, is that uh, it, it all is, in our culture, the way high culture runs in this country, it's all tied to what's considered good taste. And so in the sort of cycle of our aesthetic civilization, the amount of ornament allowable within the parameters of good taste, which to me is an entirely fraudulent and made up uh, idea, because good taste only exists in, in, exists in the moment it exists. Uh, that, so I came into my job with a great passion for Victorian stuff. And there was a certain amount of resistance in acquisitions uh, because our board of trustees was still locked into Jackie Kennedy's White House, and uh, which I've also written about, by the way. And so, so I think there was, but I think that evolved. As I went through the first 15 years of my career, it became easier and easier to sell ornate, ornamented, decorated Victorian things to the trustees as, as, as cultural shifts began to embrace the 19th century and the 1980s. So I hadn't thought about it that way, but I think you're quite right. I think I, I went in with a board of trustees who only wanted to look at colonial furniture and ended up with them being willing to look at really ornate stuff. And then I've moved along into the 20th century. Um, I started off with decoration. I was in England with the way the postmodernist movement was beginning with, with the ceramists from the Royal College. And they all were very, very much into decoration. People like Liz Fritch, for instance, also used it as a sort of form of illusion uh, to create movement and uh, space on her vessels. And then I came here and I encountered um, um, what we call Volkus and Company, 
um, which was that whole group from Otis, and they were viciously anti-decoration. Um, uh, uh, they were also, also anti-woman, so maybe there's a, a kind of <laughs> a correlation there. But I, I think their problem was that they didn't see how much of what they did was decorative. You know, to me, one of the greatest decorative artists of our time is Donald Judd. You get one of those beautiful long pieces and it has different colors in each block and oh, it is just one of the most gorgeous things on earth. But I think that at that stage decoration really meant excessive decoration. Um, and so when Adrian Sachs came along uh, and started doing a sort of riff on the pottery of Sav with ornate curly Q handles and really decorative glazes. Um, at first he was looked upon with absolute horror by the ceramic community. First of all, that they weren't brown. And, um, and so, um, yes, I've encountered it, but it's it sort of, I think it comes back to, to Golden again. Uh, I've never had a problem with dec decoration uh, as long as it isn't stupid. And decoration very easily, well, I don't say it becomes stupid, some of it just is stupid. You know, showing Clark's work, those uh, deformed silver, um, somewhat Victorian, somewhat 18th century pieces. Um, I agreed to write a piece about him for Metalsmith. I try not to take on more writing these days, but if you know Suzanne Rameljack, after she's been speaking to you for three quarters of an hour, you find out that you've agreed to do something. <laughs> so I did this because the work did appeal to me, and what I found was that his decoration led me into a completely different place. I eventually wrote about him as a surgeon and a social worker living in uh, Dickens, England, because these seem to be um, bodies that were being repaired, that had been damaged, deformed, and somehow he had to give them a third leg so they could stand upright or do that or the other. And as he began to attach things to it, the more decorative things sort of told you that, the, that this body had come from a, a higher financial status. And then what was attached to him would be something terribly workmanlike and common, so that you could feel that in this piece it was losing this person this person, this thing, this being, this form, was losing its, its affluence and its status in society. And so that all came to me because of decorative elements in it. So when decoration can do that to you, it is really wonderful. And remember, it has a very important role in, in nature. Without decoration, no animals or insects or birds would get laid. <laughs> <laughs> um, I came from uh, the program that I went to for undergrad was uh, the museum school in Tufts University and it was a very male dominated faculty and, and I think they're all still teaching there um, and, and it was a very much a, a sort of camp of thought um, but I think the resistance that you know very brown and round um, for example and, and uh, my interest I came to ceramics from a painting and drawing and printmaking background and was sort of interested in pots um, and was taking classes through their continuing education department because that was the only place you could learn how to throw pots. You couldn't take normal day classes and learn how to throw pots. And I was doing it on the side and when I realized that I could put the surfaces that I was doing on, on the wall onto the surfaces of the, of the functional pots that I was interested in, my farmer father, dairy farmer father, all of a sudden knew how to relate to what I was doing. And I, the pretension of hanging something on the wall, which I've gone back to, obviously, um, sort of was gone. And you gave someone the entry point into the things that I was thinking about in a bigger way through the surfaces that I was putting on something that they could at least understand as a cup. And if I sort of sub subliminally entered a drawing into their life through their use of that cup, then yay. But I think the resistance that I, re that I remember feeling early on was because I was better at drawing 
and painting than I was at making those ceramic forms. And, and purely from a, a technical and, and sort of aesthetic standpoint of being so new to ceramic as a material and having drawn most of my you know, life, um, you know, we pick up pens pretty early. Um, as kids, and and sort of the facility that I had, those pots were carried by my surface, and there was a disjointed thing that was happening there because my technical skills and understanding of form and how it related to surface didn't match up, and it took a very long time, I think, for me to get there, and understand how to take advantage of that three-dimensional form, and and how it relates to the surface, and and sort of, and I'm I think I'm just getting there. So I think you know my answer is no and yes both at the same time um, for many reasons. Um, I had those abstract expressionist teachers that hated it, but at the same time I, I went to uh, RISD in I got there in 1979. I, I was I couldn't be a hippie because I was too young. So so the punk rock was happening. It was our God-given duty to rebel. So if the teacher said you know, left, we went right. So he couldn't have set it up worse. I, and they were, uh, but I think I took the rebellion thing too far because when you're talking about decoration, I think I also insisted on being a figurative artist, which was uh, incredibly unpopular at that point as well. And also I insisted on being a woman and then I decided to move to Philadelphia because I guess I just wanted to ruin my own life. But uh, <laughs> what I found was that none of that mattered. I think, like I, uh, someone said, and I also said it, but people, people have an appetite for, for ornamentation, and uh, so it, maybe it was not popular in, in the elite art circles for a while, but wow, just, you know, wait a minute, and it'll change kind of thing. So it did. Okay, could we have the house lights up? And uh, we would like to open the floor to questions from the audience. We have, um, I think, two volunteers manning the microphones, uh, one on each side. So if anyone would like to um, step up for, for a question, raise your hand and we'll bring a mic over to you. Somebody, anyone? Is there a question? Where? Okay, question. Mickey. This isn't exactly about craft, decoration and craft, but in this morning's uh, Washington Post, in the style section, there was an article about how millennial, the millennial generation is rejecting the things of the boomer generation of their parents. And I was wondering if that's kind of an oversimplification in your opinion, or if this has some major, this is gonna have some major impact on the acquisition of craft by this upcoming generation. Anyone? Molly, how about you? <laughs> Well, I think it's, it's kind of a non-event, you know, it's the, that story you can write every few years about everybody. Um, you know, the, the, your children are always sort of rejecting um, um, what the parents had because very simply they want to create their own identity. They don't want to inherit the parents' identity. The grandchildren want to, so don't get rid of your stuff because the grandchildren will take it. Um, I have two unusual sons, though, who sort of watch the movement of every artwork in our home with a very possessive edge, so we, we have shared a lot. But I don't think it really, it, it, it just means that there's a transference of taste from one thing to another. It doesn't, it happens all the time. I think it's happening less now, though because the difference between generations um, is, is less um, radical than it used to be. Um, at least in our household it is. Do we have another question? In, in the meantime, while the mic is traveling, oh, or maybe she's gone. Um, 
I've noticed the advent of these 3D printers, and how does that affect sort of design, craft, and, and even decoration? I, I think it's, what's happening is really interesting. Uh, um, what it, the software uh, f that drives those printers is extremely difficult to um, master. It takes years. There's a very steep and very long learning curve. But um, once that learning curve has been uh, mastered, uh, people are now trying to think of forms that you can make with a printer that actually cannot be made any other way. And uh, those forms are generally very complex and uh, generally um, uh, fascinating for their complexity. And the, and the leading edge of that now, as was seen in the, um, in the show at uh, the Museum of Arts and Design a year and a half ago, is that the, I think the, the most interesting stuff are things that are generated on a computer and then uh, produced in part by a, a machine, a digitally driven machine, and then assembled by hand. Uh, so there, the, what is going on now is this marriage between the digital and the hand that is really, really interesting and some very fascinating things are coming out of that. Somebody else? Yeah, it, it's still in a very primitive stage. I mean, if you get the smaller printers, you can do a box, a kind of diamond thing, and something that looks like dog poop. And um, it, because um, it sort of does this thing, and it's all formless and pretty horrible. Um, I don't know if it's going to change decoration. It could make it much more complex. It could go into, uh, into, into uh, depth and an illusion, perhaps, in a much more dramatic way. Will it start producing absolutely new decoration, new shapes, new forms that we've never seen before? Or will it just um, take them and reintroduce them in a different, in a different way? Uh, it also depends what material you're in. In ceramics, I'm not sure about its future because you you print an, an, an object uh, in some other material, the object is complete. You print it in clay, it has to be taken away and still fired. It seems to be uh, not the ideal way to go, but it has very practical applications, one of which is um, in half a day um, printing a, a two-bedroom house in concrete. So it's, you know, it's a revolution that's coming. I think art is having a very tough time finding out how to manipulate it and use it to their um, advantage. Another question? For an artist to create a highly decorated piece takes a lot of time, and you all have um, spoken to that. Um, but for um, the audience to interact with a highly decorated piece also takes a great deal of time. And going forward, are people in society going to be willing to take the time to interact with these highly decorated pieces? Um, because you were talking about the past, the present, and the future. But if people continue to have shorter and shorter um, attention spans, you know, the, the video game attention span, will they be able to understand, appreciate, and interact with highly decorated objects? Can I answer that? Uh, I think it's a matter of seduction. So, yes, if the highly decorated object is also seductive, then they're going to stick around and wait for the payoff. Uh, also, the way art objects work in, in time isn't quite like you have to read, you don't read them like a book, you don't watch them like a television show. So if, if you have it around, you will accumulate time with it, rather, it's, so it's cumulative, it's not like you just sit there, unless it's in a museum, but that, that's, museums sort of are, provide a false experience in some ways because of that, but, uh, so I think it would naturally happen if someone owned one. I would also think that there's, um, uh, maybe people are not as entranced by a single object, but they might be satisfied by a multiplicity of objects, which would track with the, the, the uh, development in craft uh, toward installations. So I, I think that's a likely outcome too. 
it's, I, I mean, this is just sort of a personal reaction to things because one, video games take an inordinate amount of time and attention and it's the only time and attention my son focuses on anything. <laughs> and he will spend hours in his room living in these fantasy worlds usually related to warfare and they're visually very complex. They're very decorative, not necessarily in a pretty way. But on the other hand, the cell phone is one of the most highly ornamental decorative objects that exists in the world and you can change it by touching it. And I think that's a constant, but the difference is that a work of art on the wall in a traditional sense is something that you interact with purely through eyes and mind, not touching. So that you don't interact, you're passive in the way you absorb it. You have to use your senses in a different way. And I think my children's generation, I guess those are the, are those millennials or my children are even younger? No, they're millennials. Yeah. Um, haven't learned how to interact passively. That sounds like an oxymoron. But they haven't learned how to just sit and look. They have to move and touch. And that's the dilemma that museums face to the point where you get satirical articles about museums are allowing people to rub their faces on the paintings so they'll get it. Uh, and then on the other hand, I take my daughter to the Villa Borghese in Rome and you walk through these rooms which is sort of an interactive thing and she's looking at Bernini sculptures and she's freaking out and mesmerized and captivated and I almost burst into tears. I was so pleased that she cared about something old. So I, I think again, it's like with 3D printing, I think the influence of interactive technology has totally shifted the way young people see the world. And I can only get a glimpse of that on my cell phone because I don't know how to work it properly. But I think, I think things are shaking out. And I, think, and I don't think anybody can say right now what's going to happen. I hope to God it gets better because my, my concern is that, uh, that it will go in the wrong direction and that, 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 that still art will get lost somewhere. But I can't see that. One of the directions it is going in, and this is what threatens the artist, is that all of these things, including the printer now, um, means that people can make their own art. Uh, not necessarily something framed sitting in a gallery, but they can sit in front of their computer. They can manipulate a photograph. I mean, photography has taken a terrible hit uh, because with a fairly short learning curve, you can do extraordinary photographs because of the new technology. So uh, photographers have sort of dropped off the map in vast numbers because uh, the amateurs can do it now too. Um, and so that I think is going to be our greatest challenge is that somebody can go and make a painting, they can make a sculpture, and maybe they're going to spend more time, and is this a good thing or a bad thing? It's a bad thing for artists, maybe it's a good t thing for people is that they can do their own creativity. Um, they can produce an object on a screen and then go through 50 patterns to see which one excites the most on that object. Um, so yes, museums have a severe problem because of exactly what you said. It's too passive an environment for the younger community. They, they, they can't take control, I suppose. They're so used to clutching those things, you know. Um, that's the one part of it. Um, the other is that, um, you know, we, we have too many museums and the money is starting to disappear for them. So their ability to create now new museums with an interactive environment that a younger person will come into is beginning to reduce. And we're also losing the artist. Um, there was a great piece, I think, in hyperallergic, yeah, that's what I read now that I'm in C file, um, and it said it, it said it's the end of the artist, the beginning of the creative creative entrepreneur. And let's face it, look at it, look at the top artists. I mean, <laughs> to what extent are they artists, and to what extent are they creative entrepreneurs? It doesn't really matter because if you are not that, sorry. If you are not that, you're not going to make it. You've got to find a way to be your own business person as well. So what they mean is the idea of, you know, Vincent van Gogh sitting, cutting his ears off, and then finally being discovered by the world, and all that sort of romanticism is gone. Now what an artist is, artist is, is somebody who's creative, who has the ability to communicate and market those ideas. 
or else they're not going to survive. Um, so I think we, you know, if we came back um, 25 years from now, it would be very spooky, but if we all came back 25 years from now, the landscape will have changed in ways that we can't even imagine now, and it's all because of the technology. Well, with that thought, we will close. I <laughs> want to thank you very much for coming. I hope you had a good time. I want to thank our panel for a delightfully absorbing and interesting presentation. <laughs>